welcome and thank you for uh, joining the University of Chicago on a, on a, for a very special night and program. I'm delighted to see so many um, alumni. Are there alumni here? Can you, can you raise your hands? Yeah. Uh, current students, uh, newly admitted students, and we have a lot of prospective students. Uh, it's an exciting time to be with the University of Chicago, and as I look out at this audience and I think about our panelists, uh, you are very much in the ethos of UChicago in that if you're here tonight, you're very concerned and interested in urban policy and what's happening in Chicago. And you are probably uh, out in the forefront taking the ideas that our faculty have developed through their research and putting them into practice and impact to transform lives. And for the last 130 years, that's been a core part of what University of Chicago has been a part of and what we've been doing in the city of Chicago. Uh, my name is Runjan Daniels. I'm a, an alum of the Harris School. I'm also the senior associate dean who uh, oversees admissions. So for anyone that's interested in learning about our programs, we have our admission team out here to talk about different ways you can study and learn at the University of Chicago. We have an evening program, a civic leadership academy for people who are emerging leaders who want to learn from our UChicago faculty on a Monday and then put those ideas into practice at the Park District or the Budget Office or Blue Cross Blue Shield on Wednesday. Uh, so we have those programs available. And as we think about policy and innovation, uh, our faculty, students are, are really adept at program evaluation and the analytics and the science and the interconnectedness of policy issues. But to drive meaningful innovation and change, it takes leadership. Uh, it takes leadership to break through silos in government, to break through racial and ethnic uh, differences. Uh, and that leadership, that change management, is going to be a core part of this new uh, Lightfoot, Mayor Lightfoot administration. And we have three people that will be at the forefront of that. And when we're thinking about leadership, change management, uh, building a winning team, uh, it, it was first and foremost in my mind to, to make sure that we had Dean Baker, uh, the dean of the Harris School of Public Policy, <laughs> moderate this, this uh, panel. Not just because she's my boss, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, two years ago, uh, Dean Baker joined us from the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Uh, she was the leading uh, architect of the Medicaid Oregon Exper Expansion Study which is one of the highly cited health policy studies uh, in the US. And she joined us, and we knew we were going to get a world-class researcher, but we got that plus an incredible leader. Uh, over her two years as dean, we've seen incredible growth in our student diversity in terms of we have students this year that will be from 50 different countries, uh, incredible growth in underrepresented first-generation students, we moved into our new facility at the Keller Center, which is the most advanced, environmentally sound uh, academic building in the country or the world. We've attracted scores of new faculty members who are pioneering breakthroughs in emerging fields. And through that, I've gotten to see her leadership and her, con her coalition building skills at a ringside level. Joining Dean Baker on this panel, we have you know, three great uh, exemplars who will be at the forefront of innovation uh, in Chicago. Uh, Eleanor Gorski will, is the acting planning commissioner, will be the first deputy, uh, has had a long, is an architect, has been at the forefront of some of the most storied development projects in Chicago, Wrigley Field expansion, downtown development, uh, but I think in the next few months and years, you'll see equally splashy innovation that's happening in neighborhoods like Roseland, in the back of the yards, in Englewood, uh, reaching places that haven't seen that, the development that we see outside this window. And as she's doing that, I know that she'll be joined by Harris faculty, students, UChicago alumni, who are, who are at every level of those initiatives to bring development across Chicago, working with community leaders, collecting data, and changing policy for the better. Joining uh, Eleanor is uh, Dr. 
Allison Arwadi, who's the Acting uh, Commissioner of Health. And one thing that you'll note um, by this new administration is you hear a lot of uh, voice and um, policy that talks about the interconnectedness of various issues. So uh, a key barrier to economic development is, is health outcomes. And if people aren't, uh, they're having inadequate access to health care or wellness, uh, they aren't able to um, thrive in school or work. And the health department is, is in so many ways uh, making a difference in people's lives. And I think it'll be great to hear from her. And then uh, and both Eleanor and Allison, I welcome home as alums of the, the Civic Leadership Academy. So thank you for your service and what, you, what you're doing. And finally, we've got Joe Ferguson, who is the Inspector General uh, for 16 years in the city of Chicago, former uh, US attorney. Uh, and I think one of the barriers beyond leadership and, and great ideas is the, is the wall of skepticism that maybe not people in this room, but outside of this room may feel about public policy or government. And Joe's office is working to sort of chip away and, and promote transparency, integrity, and I think that'll be a, a key catalyst to, to bring in citizens from around the city to, to work together in these areas. So with that, I, I w again extend my welcome, and Dean Baker, the panel and the program is yours. Thank you. It's so exciting to see so many different constituencies out here from incoming students. I've already met a couple uh, to alums that I see in the audience to people who are just interested in learning more about Harris or learning more about public policy in the city. We are uh, dedicated as a policy school first to equipping our students with cutting edge tools to be able to understand what policies work, what policies don't work, how to deploy them in the real world. But then students come to Harris and our faculty push those envelopes forward because we care about actually getting the policy in practice. That's what makes a policy school different from an economics department or a political science department. Of course, we harness all of those tools, but it's the outcomes for the neighborhoods we live in, for the cities we live in, for the communities we serve that are the driving force behind why the faculty are doing their research, why students are acquiring those skills, and the amazing things that our alums are doing out in the world. And I'm thrilled to have two alums here from the Civic Leadership Academy. And we don't hold it against you that you're not a Harris alum, especially because you employ so many of them. So you got to pass on that. Um, and, but but I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you and share with our audience both your own career paths and how you got to the important positions that you're in and what you see as some of the exciting things you're going to tackle in the coming years, some of the challenges, some of the exciting opportunities in the city that you're dealing with, and that maybe people will have a chance to join you in addressing in the coming years. So I would like now to turn to maybe start by asking you a little bit about how you got to the positions you are and, and what tools you've harnessed along the way and the decision making that got you to be able to tackle the issues that you are. And, and maybe I'll start with Allison, talk a little bit about you know, how you got to where you are. I, of course, have a soft spot for the public <laughs> health issues, and I'd, I'd love to hear about your journey there. Sure. Um, and thank you for having me and having us. And it's lovely to see so many folks turning out uh, to talk more about this. So um, where shall I start? I'll be brief to say that, first of all, I never would have predicted when I was in college that I would be doing what I do now. Um, I was not even pre-med. Um, I don't think I knew what public health was. And in my early 20s, um, I worked in a series of jobs in New York City um, that were pulling me more toward health care initially. And then I came to really understand um, what public health was and started taking some classes while I was working. Um, and then got a job, frankly, in public health. Um, and very often, it's when you are working that you actually actually figure out what your passions are and where those fit in. And so I worked for the CDC initially, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I did a lot of international work um, with them. I lived in Botswana. I lived in Uganda. Um, and then I decided to actually come back. And then I went to medical school. So I did this in a slightly different order than many folks do um, because I wanted to really have a, first, I like seeing patients. I still see patients. But I wanted to have a better understanding of how a lot of the medical work fit into the public health that I 
knew was going to be the core of what I do. Um, I later worked for the CDC again, but now more in a medical officer position. Um, again, a lot of international work. So I respond to outbreaks all over the world. That's probably what my most um, sort of my deepest subject matter expertise is in. So you might remember the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome was a very scary, it still is scary, a respiratory disease that broke out initially in Saudi Arabia. I got to go with CDC to be part of the team helping the, C the um, Saudi Arabian Ministry of Health on you know, what this disease was, how should we get a handle on it, what are the public health approaches. The big Ebola outbreak a few years ago, um, I got to be in Liberia for that, um, again, working with the Ministry of Health around what needed to be put in place in the hospitals, but also, frankly, when you're thinking about these issues that affect your whole society, when you're closing your schools, when your hospitals are not operating, when you need to think about the basics, um, how do you prioritize some of that? And so um, I had moved to Chicago. I was working for the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, and then about four years ago, was offered the opportunity to move over to the Chicago Department of Public Health as the chief medical officer there. Um, and I've been in that role for about four years. And it's great. I mean, if you like public health like I do, and you like the city of Chicago like I do, um, it's been really such a mix of um, issues that I get to work on. I've always been someone who likes to work broadly across issues. Um, and I, the thing I had to give up to do that, um, at least for now, was that international work um, because the city of Chicago has no interest in you know, paying for me <laughs> to do that international piece. Um, but a lot of the, the, um, the skills that I had built, sort of doing that and the work that I, you know, you, you, if you work internationally or you work in settings that are not your own, you have to get pretty good at how to quickly build some rapport and build some trust and make sure that you're working toward the same goals um, and I think some of those skills are not any different than you know when you're in a community meeting, um, you know, in uh, Englewood or wherever, um, and pulling a lot of different um, groups together who really care about the city may have very differing ideas about what we as the health department should be prioritizing. But at the end of the day, want what is best for the city of Chicago and for health. So I've really enjoyed it. I've been in the acting commissioner role now um, since just after the mayoral transition. Um, which has been another whole level of more politics again, actually. So um, it's been great. I never would have predicted that I would, would have been where I am, but I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I, I want to pick up uh, on both Ebola and mayoral transitions. <laughs> it's two very important topics. But I, I want to turn to Eleanor to hear a bit about uh, how you got to be where you are, what skills you use the most, and, and any uh, tips sure. you give people about your path. Sure. Um, so as Allison was saying, it's through work that you decide where you're going to go. And in my case, um, I started out in art history and history. And through working in museums and in academic settings and galleries, I decided I did not want to do that. Um, so it was helpful in that way. So I would encourage everyone to take advantage of internships, jobs that kind of put you in the field that you have an interest in. But what it did trigger for me is an interest in architecture. And rather than studying art in art history, I studied architectural history. And that led me to do some study abroad work and learning how buildings are restored by craftsmen in Italy and different countries in Europe. And I thought, I really want to bring that back to the US. And when I graduated many years ago, that was a burgeoning field, historic preservation. And there weren't a whole lot of folks in the US who could marry history, architecture, and the technical knowledge. So from there, I went to architecture school. I wanted to have a technical degree because I thought, especially as a woman in this field that was largely dominated by men, by craftsmen, by contractors, it was important for me to have those professional credentials rather than just a history degree um, going into historic preservation. So I ended up at the University of Illinois and that's how I then came to Chicago for a few private architecture jobs. And like many other fields um, in architecture, you need to work in your profession before you can sit for an exam and become licensed. And that was very important for me as well, to have that work done, that, that uh, license. And then almost immediately upon getting my license, the city of Chicago friends there approached me and said, we have an opening in the Historic Preservation Division. Would you be interested? 
And that was like, oh my god, that's what I've been working towards this whole time. So I was thrilled to take this position in the city that's known for its architecture. And then from there, I just um, was able to work in all the neighborhoods in different scales from Wicker Park, Old Town, Pullman. Got to know the city really well. Worked on a lot of the major projects downtown, as you had heard. But what surprised me is I really liked working with just ordinary folks in the neighborhoods, talking about history, helping them with their, with their projects, with their homes. And I got to know the city in community building. And that has been such a plus for me, working for the city. And I really love it. And I, I just want to learn more and more. And I learned about finance. I learned how to help people finance their homes, their projects. And um, from there, I just gained more responsibility in the department. I've been at the city over 20 years. So I am a career bureaucrat. Mm -hmm. But I'm proud to say that, because every day I learn something new. and. Um, hopefully helping the people of the city. And I'm looking at the Riverwalk, which was one of our projects. So um, it's thrilling to see some of the projects that I've worked on actually um, being used and having folks enjoy it. So. And, and there's some interesting common threads in what you've both said about learning about your own preferences and passions through experience and experimenting and yeah. following that where it leads. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to turn to you, Joe, to ask about, you know, how you came to your position and what some of the favorite things you work on are and, and what experiences you had along the way that drove you. So I'm going to talk along the lines of the introduction. Um, one of these things is not like the other. I'm not a Harris graduate. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. I have an entirely different path. I did not start out with a notion of being a uh, heading a government agency. And I, I think Allison' uh, initial observation is really an abiding one. Wherever you think you're going right now, that's probably not where you're going to end up. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, so my path was to go to law school. Um, and I had a notion I was going to be a labor lawyer. Um, and my fascination with labor was, uh, it was sort of this confluence of of community, corporation, politics, all that sort of stuff. And I had a notion that it was a paradigm that was failing. Um, and in retrospect, um, I, uh, uh, in looking at a decision I made not to be a labor lawyer and go in a different direction, I actually didn't go in a terribly different direction. I have spent my entire life obsessed with paradigms that do not work. <laughs> Um, and I, uh, after law school, um, I became uh, eventually a federal prosecutor for 15 years, and um, it's a fascinating place, um, a, a fascinating vantage point on the human prospect, because what you're looking at every single day and dealing with are, um, at an individual level, um, things where uh, the paradigm did not work. Um, and quite often, uh, that would be, and a lot of the work that I did um, was major uh, corporate fraud, financial fraud, program fraud in the federal government. And to make um, a, a good and effective case, investigation and prosecution, you have to understand a little bit of the system um, within which um, the misconduct actually occurred. And so inevitably, you start to understand some of the shortcomings that may exist, say, within a major program. And um, as a lawyer, and being a lawyer means you're smarter than everybody else. Um, uh, and you're, 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 not in, you're, you're, you're not in the least disinclined to hold your opinions back. You would tell the people within the agencies and running the agencies and programs, hey, look, there's some problems that we've seen along the way. And, um, the response typically is, thank you, Mr. Lawyer. Um, why don't you stick to your job, and we'll take care of ours. And in the context of doing that work, um, I came to work with actually a fair number of federal inspectors general, um, and uh, came to understand that um, IGs operate in a very, very unique place in government and in society um, with a unique structure. Um, the typical inspector, uh, inspector general, fully empowered and authorized, um, undertakes two forms of activity. One is investigative, um, to identify the malfeasance, um, uh, to recover money, uh, and to remove bad actors from the system. Um, that's one side of it. 
Um, but the other side of it is um, uh, performance audit, government performance audit specifically. And the reason that those two things came to be housed under one roof is exactly what I just said with respect to being an investigator and prosecutor. In order to understand the crime that you are investigating and about to prosecute, you have to understand the context and where the context are systems and, and large institutions, you come to see their failings. But you don't have the expertise to actually know what to do about that, to actually assess really what the underlying problems may be. And in the context of, of an IG shop, that observation goes to the other side of the house, government performance auditors. And we hire lots of people from the Harris School to be performance auditors, and I'll talk about why later. But those folks, you know, they will scope out an audit to look at a program or an operation, and um, they will find indicia of potential risks and possible wrongdoing, but they're not investigators and prosecutors, and so they send that to the investigation side. And these two things in dynamic can bring about outcomes where the bad actors are removed and systems are actually fixed to prevent those negative outcomes in the future. And that is something that fascinated me as a prosecutor. Um, and, uh, and singly, as a prosecutor, um, as a lawyer generally, uh, in the context of the inspector, uh, of inspector general work, it is um, that unwillingness to um, submit to paradigms, existing paradigms, um, that um, I don't know where it comes from personally. It's an obsession, but quite often it's the only way to move forward. I remember in college reading Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, um, and that has stayed with me throughout. Um, but that ability to be in a place where you get to engage more broadly outside and beyond a paradigm, and I have the benefit that these two people don't have, which is I don't have to run a government bureaucracy. <laughs> I get to just look at it and look at it from an aparadigmatic perspective and then tell them, hey, there's better ways of doing this, um, which is fun. Um, so that's uh, an aspect of my path. Well, you're all digging into some incredibly pressing and important policy issues. And I think, you know, again, I know I'm biased. I think people are aware of how life-changing public health issues are, but then the portfolio of things that falls under the Inspector General's umbrella may be surprising to some people, and we can dig into some of the things your office is investigating sure. now, and the importance of the built environment in promoting health and mm -hmm. equity and neighborhood neighborhoods thriving, mm -hmm. I think, is underappreciated. And I'm new to Chicago myself, relatively new, and it is amazing mm -hmm city of architecture and neighborhoods, and that's a wonderful richness, but it also presents some city planning challenges to have such different neighborhoods with such different resources and such different infrastructure, and I know that you've been working on some projects to help neighborhoods thrive, and I'd love, to, mm -hmm. love for you to share a little bit about the approach that you're taking and what some of the challenges you're wrestling with are. So Allison and I, um, I, I don't know if it was before we took the CLA class, but public health and planning, has we've started to work together more and more because her shop handles environmental issues. DPD handles a lot of sustainability, waterfront issues, as well as industrial corridor work, which we started under the previous administration. This administration would like us to continue that and also to um, support our public health colleagues in finding solutions to some of the environmental issues that we're seeing with the industrial users, especially close to um, these residential neighborhoods. So in terms of um, the diversity of neighborhoods, um, the work that we both have been doing and trying to tackle, Pilsen and Little Village is an area that is experiencing a lot of change right now. and both in the industrial area, um, we do have uh, the canal there, the river there, and then we also have um, the Paseo Trail, which we're hoping to develop like the 606 as an amenity, and then there's the pressure of gentrification on the neighborhood as well. So that's an area that we've worked very hard over the years, I'd say the past three or four years, 
with Allison's group, the environmental groups, to look at all of those as a whole. And last fall, we came out with a five-pronged approach um, involving different city agencies, housing, environment, um, our sustainability division, and parks to address a lot of the issues there. Um, but that is, again, a very particular planning exercise because of the demographics, the issues there. And then it was interesting seeing um, how the interest in what we were doing there spread to other neighborhoods like the southeast side of the city. And they've requested our assistance to come and do the same planning exercise. Well, and the tie between the built environment and what goes on in yes. health disparities right. seems really important and on sharp display in a lot of cities, but in, in Chicago, of course, in a particularly demarcated way. I know the life expectancy differences are vast between yep. the west side of the city and downtown, and your office is working on addressing some of these. What are some of the tools in your toolkit? Yeah, kit? sure. So um, we have had for the last, I'd say, four or five years, really a laser focus on health equity at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, we really changed everything about how we measure success. Um, it wasn't about was the city as a whole doing better on health outcomes. We really, we track more than 200 you know, health outcomes across the city and we looked at which subgroups were furthest from where you would want them to be. Sometimes that subgroup, um, you know, often we talk about race or ethnicity, sometimes we talk about age, sometimes we talk about neighborhood, sometimes we talk about um, LGBTQ and we specifically defined our success by how well those subgroups where we put our resources, the progress that they're making. And so looking ahead a little bit, we also, you know, as Eleanor said, we have a little bit of an imperialist view that public health is in all things. Um, but we think it's right uh, because so much of this, you know, just to, um, but so, you know, so much of where, where you really think about public health is not really about health care. People don't understand this always. Yeah. Um, public health is really about the policy policies, the systems, and the environments um, that we create sort of as a society. And so um, this environmental type work, um, or when we're thinking about root causes, things like housing and education, those are not our core piece, but they very directly impact um, people's health outcomes and then vice versa, as was said at the beginning. And so looking ahead to um, our next iteration, um, our first plan was called Healthy Chicago 2.0. I encourage you to Google it if you're interested to see how you can actually try to take this equity dis, um, discussion and make it practical. For our next Probably Healthy Chicago 2025, we're drilling in very specifically on the black, white, life expectancy gap in Chicago, which is 8.8 .8 years across the whole city. And the top driver of that, 3.8 years, is chronic disease, cardiovascular, especially related to obesity, built environment, all those underlying things. That's the biggest one. But then next on that 2.2 years of that life expectancy disparity, homicide. So lots of conversation, working with other groups, working on the violence. Next still comes infant mortality about 0.7 years. So we're going to be launching some new initiatives about universal home visiting after birth. Um, next, still HIV and infectious diseases. That's something we've been working on like crazy and we continue to, but we still see such differences in terms of outcomes. And then finally, fifth is um, the opioid crisis, which is very disproportionately affecting older African-American men here in Chicago. There are more people who die of opioid overdoses than gun violence by hundreds um, every year in Chicago. And so for our next plan, as we're thinking about these systems, policies, environments, we're putting additional resources into these things, really trying to push on this life expectancy gap um, as a way of framing and continuing to build on the health equity work. Can I add something to what Allison said? So all those statistics to me are so impressive and Allison's team is great in assembling all this information. They are go-to resource for other city departments in terms of statistics on all different types of things. But it also reminds me that the Harris School is working on a housing study in Woodlawn, which is another area that we will be working in soon. And um, so the, the skills that you're learning here directly are applicable to what we do every day. That is an excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And, and 
uh, so much of the amazing innovation in policy in Chicago to me seems driven by the interconnectedness mm -hmm. of the agencies and the availability of cross-silo data because so many mm -hmm. things like life expectancy or public safety can't reside in one silo of government activity. There, we know people's lives are affected by healthcare and the built environment and their schools and the safety of their neighborhoods and the environmental assaults that they may face and all of those combine to produce a whole range of outcomes and having that interconnected web of data as well as governance mm -hmm. seems crucial. And I know a lot of these things touch on your office as well, Joe. You know, your office is looking into things like the data that the police use when they uh, execute search warrants or the, govern the processes by which aldermen can appoint people to different positions and looking into good governance in the city as well. Uh, I'd love to hear more about some of those projects. So the, absolutely, and I just want to pivot to the offerings of um, Eleanor and, and Allison in the moment. Um, I think the challenge of our moment is to deal with um, uh, uh, things that we know must be addressed transactionally because of the data, because of the type of data that Allison is talking about. We know we have these, these extraordinary variations in life expectancy, and we know what the causes are. And um, uh, the challenge of somebody in her position is she must develop initiatives and policies immediately responsive to each of those separate phenomenon. Um, and uh, in this moment, though, we're not going to get out of where we are unless we also free up some bandwidth for the transformational. And it's that tension between the transactional and the transformational that really is the challenge of the moment. The transactional, we barely can find the money, and in fact, we're behind on the money that we need to address things transactionally. And to do things transformationally um, means to go big, which costs even more money. So, there are constraints, and I think in the context of, of a, um, a policy-oriented institution, I think it's really important to understand that none of us just get to do policy freely. We, get to, we look at policy against a backdrop of extraordinary constraints in terms of our ability to apply it. Um, in the context of what, and, and so that's one point. And another point is when we're talking about public health, Behind all of that is that sort of broader question of what is a healthy community, all right? It's not simply individual human health. And that's where there's a connect up between what Eleanor is speaking to and what Allison is speaking to and then what our office looks at. And so we know from the data what the components are, the block, the building blocks um, are, um, and the problems are for um, uh, elements of what goes into a healthy community, um, a vibrant community, but somebody needs to be thinking above all of that from the top down, as it were, to say, what does all of this look like when it's right-sized, when it's rightly resourced, when it's rightly calibrated? And so there is this, again, transformational versus transactional challenge against the constraint of, of resources that, that, that really is where the rubber meets the road. Um, in the context of the work that we do in our office, I'm going to go to some really, really kind of boring places um, uh, to tell the story of how, so for, in order for people to, um, uh, in uh, underserved communities, um, to go to where the jobs are means you have to have good transportation systems, all the way down to having good roads, right? And how the city actually resurfaces and maintains its roads is different from how it's done everywhere else in the Western world. Decisions are made at a hyper-local level as to which streets are going to be paved. The city itself has no survey no technologically based survey of the conditions of all its roads and a plan for how it's going to treat those roads in order to make them last longer. 
And the consequence is, once politics seep in, is that we have a tale of two cities as to our roads. We have a tale of two cities as to everything. And so we, we generate a project actually looking at how it is that we are resurfacing our roads. And one of the things that we do in a project like that is make sure we bring forward data in a way that actually tells the story that we all kind of know intuitively is the case in our various sort of compartmented ways, but kind of names the elephant in the room attached to data that tells the story of the whole community, of the whole city, that then changes the dynamics of how the discussion is held. It turns discussions from the transactional into the transformational. And so we hold that in mind as we're doing individual projects like you know, street resurfacing or individual project on how the city is using money uh, obtained from the Affordable Requirements Ordinance with respect to the development of low-income housing. These things, the data becomes sort of empowering from the bottom up, but telling the story of the whole um, to get us out of that transactional thinking, and I know I'm using a lot of buzzwords, but it goes back to that notion that we're all kind of stuck in paradigms um, at the day-to-day -day level in terms of how we operate, and it's really hard to kind of figure out uh, where the bandwidth is to think more broadly. So that's a, a great uh, opportunity for me to ask my last question because I want to leave some time for audience questions. So get your questions ready. Line up by the mics. You know, there's going to be about 15 minutes of audience questions. But you've each mentioned your teams. You've each uh, highlighted something that's near and dear to our hearts at Harris, which is how we can harness data and analytics to highlight problems come up with solutions, drive those solutions into practice. You know, we're an institution dedicated to that evidence-based policymaking endeavor. And I think there are a lot of people in the audience who aspire to work in teams like yours and someday maybe grow up to be you. So <laughs> I would love to ask a final question of each of you. What do you look for when you're hiring people? What are the skills you think are most worthwhile for people to invest in What's made your team successful? You know, can I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna break the you rules here. You can answer anything you want, that's totally <laughs> I fair. I wanna tag on to what Joe said. So what I find really interesting about this administration, and we didn't get to that question, I so know. I'm gonna add that so myself. So many questions, <laughs> please. Um, so you were saying there's a difference between the transactional and the transformational, and I'm finding those at this time, and I think because we have such change happening, really colliding, and I was just thinking this morning, and it seems like it's happening every morning now, where we have a project that we're reviewing, and this particular morning, it was an affordable housing project in Logan Square on city-owned land next to a transit stop. So in my mind, I'm thinking of all those different policies that were put together in the previous administration and in this administration, adding density and affordability near transit stops so you can get to jobs, um, adding affordable housing. But we also have a budget crisis. So this lot in Logan Square is worth a whole lot of money. Do we write it down, write down the cost of it to achieve those other policy goals? Or is there a way that we can balance this? So I do find that we're having these debates, but quickly to get to a decision to keep things moving um, more so now than we would have previously, where it was just, you know, get it done, this is the direction you're given. We're given more room to do that. So I hope that excites the policy folks here in the crowd that we are doing some of that now, I think a lot more. Um, so to your question as to who I, I would look for to hire on my team, and I have some of them here, I won't point them out, um, but folks who are curious and who really question things and can debate and have an opinion, and I hope that as a manager, I provide that environment where people can come in with new ideas, even if you're a new employee, and I would say especially if you're a new employee, bringing those new ideas with you and kind of looking at how we're doing things and looking at it from a different way. And I would say that the skills are even less important than that, because you'll pick that up, but it's your attitude going in and really willing to open yourself up to, to new things. Yeah, I would just add maybe um, 
depending a little bit on what role it is. As Eleanor said, at the health department, we do have a very large data role. Um, and so we have more than 30 epidemiologists and many other people who work closely with data. And so certainly, we have a particular data bent, I would say, at the health department. Um, but whatever role people are in, I'm less interested in whether they have done this exact thing before. I actually mm -hmm. don't usually, I'm not looking for someone to replicate something Thing that they've done elsewhere. I want people who have shown um, success and an ability to enact some change in some way toward the positive in a prior role that they've been in. And so, um, you know, using, I mean, even if I look back on my, my own history, like, places where I was able to make success uh, you know, happen are not directly related to some of the work that I now do. Um, but those skills, and that would be the same for you, that the skills that you build when you really care about something and you pull together other people who care about that and manage to get something done. Um, get something done in a job that you're in. Get something done in the community. Uh, get something passed. Get you know whatever it is. Um, if you really can do that, you build those skills sort of along the way. Um, I think uh, again, having some of the the basics around like for, for me, some public health, some some data type training, um, specific skills. But it's really about um, some of those softer things that people will build uh, by going out and doing things um, in. In, in the world. Yeah, I absolutely concur with that. Um, the, the skills um, you can identify from people's educational backgrounds, some of their work experience, and um, it's rare to have a, a, a hiring sequence where you don't see those skills in abundance. And so then the question is, how are you sorting these people? And you're sorting them on the basis of, of, of what Allison refers to as the softer things, and I think Eleanor speaks to um, really, really well. Um, in the context of what I think we all do, um, uh, we work in highly analytical, highly critical environments within our systems. And so somebody needs to, uh, it, I'm looking for somebody who handles critique without attaching it to judgment, appreciating that, that the dynamic of critique in both directions is how we get better. That's something that we're often reading into space and really soft dynamics in interviews. Um, uh, and at the same time, um, all enormously smart, uh, educated people, um, we're looking for folks who aren't all that caught up specifically in the education that they have, such that they're willing to receive guidance um, in a way that doesn't they don't respond to as constraint um, because um, you're, you're at the front end of your career and you should be open uh, to receive to all sorts of observations um, and perspectives around you. So it's really that softer stuff that distinguishes folks. But I would say curiosity, absolutely. Um, uh, but that curiosity um, being attached to a willingness to receive critique as to your work in the service of making it something better. Thank you, and I want to be sure we turn to some audience questions. There are a couple of mics around, uh, and I see some hands up also, so great. Hi, um, I'm Caleb Herod. Uh, I wanted to ask a quick question based off of how we started off the conversation about um, the development that's happening around Chicago. There's a lot of development that's happening around downtown and certain other areas. But I was wondering how you and your roles are trying to spur development in the west and south part of town, where it doesn't also contribute to displacement and gentrification of those neighborhoods that are already in Chicago. Um, could I take a stab at that? So thank you for that opening, because that's exactly the focus of this mayor. She's given us the directive, um, me in particular, I'm sure you as well, <laughs> that that is something that needs to change in her years in office, that we need to um, ensure that those neighborhoods are thriving on the south and west sides and are given the opportunity to kind of set their course. So. What I always like to tell my staff um, downtown in City Hall is we need to go into those communities and find out what it is that they think will make them thriving. We're not going to be making decisions here at City Hall, so it will be a lot of community engagement is what I envision, at least over the next year. But short term, 
We're also looking at identifying the city services, the resources that we do have, everything from street paving to schools, um, all these facilities that we do bring to bear on neighborhoods and focusing them on certain areas of the south and west sides to show marked visual improvement as we go ahead and um, conduct this planning exercise. But it's also bringing the folks that work here downtown and have been developing downtown into those neighborhoods. So we're having those conversations as well and utilizing those relationships that we've built through all the development you see here in the near west loop, near north side, and asking them, develop funds, develop mentorships. Um, it doesn't need to be a physical manifestation of you know, development in the neighborhood. It can simply be a presence there and a mentoring capability. So we're looking at all those things. But um, you will see change within the next four years. I'm convinced of that. Hi, thank you all for making time to come and speak to us today. So kind of building off that last question, um, recently the Inspector General's Office released a report on tax increment financing with some observations about how that occurrence is happening now. Um, what should we look forward to in the coming years and will there be any changes? That might be for you. Well, <laughs> our report said there needed to be some changes, so I think the question would be from somebody else to say what those changes would be. Look, the, I, I, uh, our, our, our report um, simply named an elephant that's long in the room in a different way, and I, 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 I think um, the larger question of whether we should have um, tax increment uh, financing districts is something that should constantly be debated. Um, but the fact of the matter is they're here, and the question from our perspective is what's necessary in order to make them operate in a way that's consonant with what the policy, stated policy objectives are for them. And we are out of alignment in that regard in a major way. And a lot of the reason that we're out of alignment is that there's no transparency and there is no actual meaningful community engagement and process around a lot of them. Um, and so that's really what our, our report um, pointed to. Um, and um, I, I believe that the new administration um, came into office with very much an understanding of that critique that has now been refreshed. And um, I think the remarks that Eleanor just made about um, the importance of development not being something that is from the top down and imposed on the basis of a vision of those downtown, the haves, might have in certain places um, uh, that have been underserved, that doesn't result in development that actually is sustained um, uh, internally. And it goes to the question of what do we need to do to have a healthy, vibrant community? What are the economic thing components that need to be built and fostered within, not in terms of just some large project plopped down into the middle of um, uh, brownfields on the west side um, and the south side, but what are all of the elements that needed to be woven and threaded together that provides for a healthy econom local economic community? Um, and for all of that, that understanding, it really needs to be the meeting of, of, of the sort of the resources from the top with the lived experience of those in the communities. And so a huge part of what it is that we do now involves being out in the community. We have a community outreach and engagement uh, function um, that, um, uh, uh, that actually feeds our decisions about what things that we are going to look at. Um, hearing, hearing Eleanor speak, it clearly is in the consciousness of those who are in, in the development realm that you can't you can't simply impose your vision um, uh, unilaterally. In this day and age, um, it won't have legitimacy, and it really it, it will have questionable outcomes at the end of the day. Can I add something on TIF? Please, now? sorry. Yeah. So, um, so my department does oversee TIF, and we received the report. And the report essentially critiqued what was to be done at the beginning of the last mayor's term and wasn't followed through totally. So I'm happy to say that this mayor has charged us with following through not just on those recommendations, but also at looking at different ways to use TIF, which are in the state statute, all of how we use TIF is in that, 
And what we're looking at are ways to use the TIF so that it's more equitable citywide, and that can be through TIF loans. It can be through different mechanisms, even creating some sort of financial institution that folks in neighborhoods of need can tap into those resources. So these are ideas that we still need to you know, follow through in terms of a policy, but we have been asked to go beyond that because we do have TIFs, they're here to stay, we will be retiring some, but we're trying to be more creative with how we deal with them. Hi, good evening, my name is Kat, and I came to Harris because I'm very concerned about climate impacts, which of course affects health issues, economic issues, housing issues. Uh, my question was inspired by something that Joe said earlier, but open to anyone on the panel. You mentioned you were welcoming critique. How do you move towards the specific? It is easy to circle the plane on high level things, but I'm interested to hear from all of you on how you get to specific immediate change that still protects vulnerable communities. Um, it was raised earlier, concerns about communities on the south side of Chicago, and certain communities are gonna be hit first and worst, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on building the political will and getting the funding from those who have benefited from wealth and privilege to contribute to these important policy changes. Who'd like the first swing? <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, uh, that, you're, really, you're really speaking to our moment right now. Um, and unfortunately, the tendency is uh, that we wait until there's a crisis in order to act. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's my sense that the sense of crisis in many respects, both from the ground up and in the broader sort of global sense of things is all about us in a way that leaves me hopeful that, um, uh, that our political leaders um, will be inclined to act before we are in um, a true state of crisis. But Chicago is extraordinarily blessed in terms of its resources, both um, in terms of the people, the institutions, um, the, the geographic features, um, to actually be a regional, if not national leader in innovation. Um, I, I think about, you know, we talk about climate, but we're also have to, we have to talk about water policy, which is immediately related to climate. And the traditional way of doing things in Chicago with respect to water policy is we build mains, we provide, you know, we get water to people's homes. Um, but Chicago should be at the center of basically the regional pact of how we revision re re water as a resource because of things like climate change um, that will drive it. And I know that that thinking exists, and I know that that sense of crisis exists within the policymakers and the leaders within the city. But I think ultimately the political will to go big where we need to go big requires an engaged citizenry whose voice is heard and heard persistently so that we're not waiting for the crisis. Unfortunately, at the moment of crisis, what happens is, is big institutions decide what's going to happen. Um, and so um, uh, uh, you know, your voice needs to be a voice that is replicated over and over again and in a constant way from the community up in order for, I think, our, our political leadership to understand they have to act now um, rather than waiting for crisis. And go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, and, and to add to that big picture piece, just because you had asked about specifics, um, I think, you know, the climate issues are ones that absolutely impact everybody but as you said you know health is is at the center of a lot of this because we're charged with thinking not just about human health but environmental health and so um, we have had some opportunity to for example bring in a lot of academic partners but also um, other researchers and people who have been thinking in creative ways um, around the country about this. We have a project going right now with NASA, for example, that's looking at satellite data and trying to figure out is there a way to take the sort of um, 
at in the moment satellite data and look at the, um, the small particles that you can see from that and potentially link that up to places that may have uh, momentary um, increases in environmental pollution and do something about that. Thinking about creating indices here in Chicago that take some of the environmental effects that we that we know like we know where there is more problems with air pollution we know where some of this is link that up to actual health in, um, outcomes here in Chicago so looking at rates of um, the you know lung disease and looking at rates of other uh, issues that have been linked to that and then tying it to the other ways in which we already know that certain communities um, need more resources to start with you map all that together it's not a surprise where resources need to go. And then you can get really practical about where are you doing your next projects that you were planning to do anyway? Where are you going to start with um, thinking about you know, changing from diesel in your bus system? Where are you going to plant your trees? Where are you going to uh, think about some of the other changes that can be done like in a very micro way? You're not going to solve this whole thing. Um, you know, it's, it, as, as Joe said, it's a real change in terms of priorities at a population level. But I would argue that at an individual level, you use a data based approach and you start doing things in the areas where you know that there are needs that are climate but that fit into how climate impacts uh, worse on people who already have other vulnerabilities. And, and I want to add too that some of I would say the more boring parts of my job maybe for them as well is writing ordinances, understanding codes, understand how things are put together. But that's invaluable when you go from Joe's big picture to Allison's like middle line looking at Chicago, how does that translate now to actually build things? So in plan developments and zoning codes, I can take this information. We are a 100 resilient city. This was a plan that was done, um, completed in May. Take those recommendations and interpret those into the zoning code and ordinances to start having buildings change, how they build their buildings to reflect this. We have river guidelines now that have best practices that we just passed in February. Anyone who builds on the river now will need to implement those guidelines. And that was done with the Army Corps. That was done with advocacy groups for the river. So I think that we are able to make those changes at this level. And this is to encourage all of you who learn about ordinances and council mm -hmm. and how to get things through. That is an important piece that affects things immediately. And if, if I could just add, add to those points, um, one of the things that often happens, um, I think, is that the policy, uh, policy is generated with consideration of politics and what sort of impact it'll make in a media cycle in terms of a reputation of a, of a political leader. Um, and what ends up getting missing, what ends up missing is the analysis at the front end that um, is needed to determine what the real resources are and um, the structure that's needed in order to effectively implement the policy and achieve the objectives. Um, uh, I generally work from critique and, 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 and the negative. Um, and I will tell you that for a long time, Chicago has not filled in the gap to figure out exactly what is needed for policy to be effectuated in a successful way. I know that both of the people sitting to my right and your left um, are dogged by critiques from my office that simply are a function of a lack of resources to implement these, the, the regulatory vision, the policy visions that they have that are embodied in ordinance. And so that's the sort of additional space that we, 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 we need to jump into here um, rather than the big grab of the, the, the moment in the media and then figuring it out after. It's going into these things with the full commitment of resources that are necessary to achieve the objectives. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. There are teams out here uh, from our admissions group, from our alumni group. So if you have questions about Harris, there are people here to ask them. I hope that our panelists will stick around a little bit because I know you have more questions to ask them. I just want to conclude by thanking you all for being here. It is a really exciting time for Chicago. 
with a new mayor and a new governor and so many pressing public policy problems, there is a lot of work to be done. And it is heartening to see so many people here who are really interested in engaging in that themselves, let alone at the national and the global level where the work that we're all dedicated to in bringing evidence-based policy to bear, analytical thinking to wrestle with difficult public problems that fundamentally affect so many people's lives, that work is more important than ever. And so every time I go to a meeting where I see so many people who are our alums doing great work, who want to raise their hands and get tooled up and dive back into the public policy work that we're all dedicated to, I feel slightly less terrified about our future. <laughs> and so I thank you all for being here. And I hope that you'll join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for sharing their work with us.